Scripture reading this morning will be coming from the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. Romans 1, 9 through 13. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, request, if by some means, now at last I, might fi- I may find a way in the will of God to come to you, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I do not want to be unaware, I I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but as hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as the other, just as among the other Gentiles. Today we talk about wonderful words, wonderful words of life. In John 6, 63, Jesus says, The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. What a privilege it is for us to be able to come together and consider such wonderful words. I would like for us to consider for just a a few moments the New Testament book of Romans. Hope you have your Bible with you today. In chapter 1 and verse 1, the book begins, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel, which was afore promised by the holy prophets in the Scriptures, concerning His Son, Jesus Christ, who according to the flesh was of the seed of David, but was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In verse number 5, he says, By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience unto the faith unto all nations. Thus we learn in verse number 1, Paul is the author. Which Paul? The Paul who was called to be an apostle. To be a special representative of Jesus Christ. Pauline authorship of Romans is is denied by almost no one. Even the most radical, critical scholars of the Bible do not deny that Paul wrote the book of Romans. Internal and external evidence as well supports this conclusion quite thoroughly. In this book, the author refers to his journey to Jerusalem with a contribution for the the poorer saints, and he was going to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, chapter 15, verse 25 through 27 of Romans. This is confirmed in other passages in the New Testament that this was indeed the Apostle Paul in Acts 19.21, 1 Corinthians 16.1-5, and 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1-12. through 12. Paul was a very devout Jew, but he persecuted the church. Before he became a Christian, before he was a child of God, he was a persecutor of the church. We learn in Acts verse 3, the Bible says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Entering into every house, hailing men and women, and committed them to prison. This man is like an animal who is going from house to house, arresting men and women, 
putting them in prison, hauling them off to jail, simply because they were Christians. In Acts 9 verse 1, the Bible says, Saul was yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. In 1 Timothy 1 verse 13, he reminds us of his life before he was a Christian. He said, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. And I was injurious. He does the same thing in the book of Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 13. He says, he laid waste to the church. He tried to destroy the church with every fiber in his brain. This is the kind of man that Saul was before he became a Christian. But something happened. He was converted to Christ. This one who hated Jesus and who hated the church was converted to the Lord. You can read about this in your own Bible in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. He became a great defender of the faith. He talked about his defense of the gospel. Often he would defend God's word from all kinds of enemies. He became one of the greatest workers in the church that God ever produced. He wrote about half of your New Testament. But think about the fact before he was a Christian, he put Christians to death. Let's think about the importance of this fascinating book of Romans. It is the premier example of epistolary form of writing. That means writing an epistle or what we would call a letter. Romans is the premier example of this kind of writing. Not only in the New Testament, but in all the ancient world. The book of Romans is looked upon as a beautiful piece of literature even by those who don't even believe the Bible's from God. It is always listed first. In all, we have many ancient writings which list all the books that the Apostle Paul wrote in his lifetime. Romans is always mentioned first. But it's not the first book that he wrote. This would indicate to us the importance of the great book of Romans. The poet said, it is the most profound book in all of human history. We must understand that often in the New Testament, there was an occasion that arose that led to the writing of these books. These people didn't just sit down and write the 27 books of the New Testament, but there was an occasion that arose within the ancient world that caused them to write these beautiful books that we have in the New Testament. Now, let's try to find the occasion for the writing of the book of Romans, for this will help us to understand the book itself. Paul was the kind of person after he became a Christian, he was constantly on the move in all of his missionary efforts. At first he did most of his work in the East. But there came a point in his life when he's going to turn his mind now to the West. Particular, particularly to Spain. This is an open field for him to preach God's truth in these many provinces of Spain. And he talks about that in Romans 15, 24 and Romans 15, verse number 28. He wants to have a fruitful work in Spain. But to have a fruitful work in Spain, it is expedient for him to first go and visit the church of Rome. 
Acts 9.21. He had many friends in the church at Rome, yet he had never visited that congregation. For some time he had planned to visit, if you look in chapter 1 and begin in verse number 10, Romans chapter 1, verse number 10, he had planned to visit these people, this congregation, but he had been so preoccupied with his work in the east that he had not been able to do this. And he wants them to know in chapter 1, verse 10 through 13, I planned to visit you on many different occasions, but was not able to do so. Now he plans to come and visit the church at Rome. And he says, I want to provide for you a spiritual gift so that you may be established. I want us to be encouraged by each other's faith. I want to have fruit among you, brethren. Chapter 1, verse 10 through verse number 13. To understand the church at Rome and the, and the book of Romans, we need to understand at least a little bit about the city of Rome in the ancient world. The city of Rome was a very, very important city in the ancient world. It was the capital city of the powerful Roman Empire that stretched to all the known parts of the earth. This is the capital of that powerful empire. This is where the leaders and the rulers of the ancient world resided in the city of Rome. To Rome is where every province looked to this great empire. All these great Roman provinces scattered throughout the world, all of them looked to Rome as their example. It was from Rome that all of these famous roads, and did you realize, it's been almost 2,000 years ago, and some of those roads are still being used today. You think about how often we got to repave our parking lot. And we think those people were ignorant back then. They're still using some of those roads built all those years ago they're still using some of those roads. All of these roads and all the well-known sea lanes that spread out all over the world, went in all directions, all of these came from Rome. When the Roman Empire began to gain power, travel in the ancient world was a very dangerous thing to do. They cleaned up the sea lanes. They stopped piracy. You know, with all of our bombs and all of our, of course, we have politics involved in it, but we still have all kind of piracy off the coast of Africa. Africa. It seems like the most powerful country in the world either cannot or will not or doesn't have the will to stop it. Rome stopped it. They made sea travel popular again. They made travel throughout the known world something that was unheard of. And thus the gospel could spread all over the world. We see the providence of God. Paul himself was a Roman citizen. A great honor in the ancient world. He understood the great power and the great influence of the city of Rome. Let's think about the church at Rome. What do we know about the church at Rome? You look in chapter 1 and verse number 1. The letter was written by the Apostle Paul. You look at chapter 1 verse 7. It was written to the saints which are at Rome. That means Christians. Saints in the Bible just means a Christian. This letter was written to the Christians at Rome, Romans chapter 1, verse 7, by the Apostle Paul. But what kind of church was the church at Rome? When did she begin? 
What do we know about the beginning of the church at Rome? Who went there and preached the gospel and founded that church in this great, great city of the ancient world? Who was the first person who went to the city of Rome and preached the gospel for the first time? Who was it that had the honor and privilege to do that? Who was it that loved lost souls enough to go to this pagan, wicked city and preach the truth of God's Word? Unfortunately, we cannot answer these questions. We simply don't know. Here's what we do know. On the day of Pentecost, you remember in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I'll build my church. In Acts chapter 2, we have the record of that church beginning on earth. It was on a Jewish feast day, because Jews would have been there from all over the world. It was on a Jewish feast day called Pentecost. So the church of Jesus Christ began on the day of Pentecost. Now, on the day of Pentecost, there were people there, Jews from all over the world, attending that feast. And Acts chapter 2, verse number 10, tells us there were people there from Rome. The apostles preached that beautiful sermon. The Lord's church was established in Acts chapter 2. There's a possibility that some of those people who became Christians In Acts chapter 2, it's a possibility that some of those were people from Rome because we know from 2.10 there were people there from Rome. Possibly they went back and spread the gospel in Rome. What do we know about the church? Chapter 1, verse 8. By the time Paul wrote this letter, she was already known as a strong congregation. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Paul says, Your faith is spoken of through the whole world. It seems that the majority of the Christians in Rome were Gentiles. You have two kinds of people in the world. Jews, Gentiles. All of us are Gentiles. The majority of the church in Rome was Gentiles. How do I know this? Chapter 1, verse 13. Paul says, I want to come to Rome and I want to have fruit among you as I do among the other Gentiles. Same type of ideas expressed in 11.13. So most of the people in the church at Rome were Gentiles. Not all of them, but the majority. We know not all of them were Gentiles because there was enough Jewish Christian to make the relation of Christianity to Judaism a living issue. Now here's what happened. When Jews became Christians, they didn't have an objection to baptizing Gentiles. They'd hated Gentiles for centuries. They didn't really have a big objection if you baptize them as long as you make them Jews first. These are called Judaizing brethren. They thought that you had to make somebody a Jew before he could even become a Christian. This is dealt with through the entire letter. That the law of Moses is no longer binding on the people of God. What about the book itself? When you open up the book of Romans, the best way to read it, it's only 16 short short chapters, the best way to read, just read it through all at one time. Wouldn't take you, it won't take you as long as you think. Just read all 16 chapters, you'll get the best idea of what the book is all about. The letter lacks the personal touch that you find in many of the letters that Paul wrote. You won't find that in the book of Romans to the extent that you do in his other letters. The 
explanation of the gospel is unequaled in Romans and any other place in the New Testament. He explains the beauty of the gospel in the book of Romans more thoroughly than any other book in all the Bible. Thus you see the importance of the book for Christians. It's not written in story form. This is, this is an epistle, but it is not written like a little storybook. It is written like an epistle. It is written like a great theological treatise. It's a beautiful, fascinating, complicated book. But if you're just expecting to sit down and read a little storybook, that's not what it is. It deals with difficult topics. And at times, it is difficult to understand. I would think this is what Peter had in mind in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16 when he said some of the things that Paul wrote are hard to be understood. Peter said that. And this is certainly true of Romans. It's a complicated book. It calls for earnest attention. It's not one of those books you can sit down and read it with one hand and then play with your children with the other hand. It's not one of those books you can sit down and watch some ridiculous TV show and then try to read the Bible. This book, if you're going to understand it, it requires your full attention when you read it. It states more clearly than anywhere else in all the New Testament the gospel that Paul preached. The faith is presented in its full strength in the book of Romans. The deep truths of our precious faith is found in this beautiful book. It contains the power of God to change a person's life. It brings the power of God, godliness into everyday human life. How more practical could you be than Romans 12? In verse number 1, Paul said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I say unto every one of you that a man ought not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but he ought to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. How practical we find in chapter 12 and following. Study it carefully. Study it thoughtfully. What was the purpose? Now we know Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write this book, what purpose did the Holy Spirit have in mind for the writing of this book? What was the purpose? The only way we can ascertain the purpose is to read through the book and find for ourselves the purpose within the writing of the book. Look in chapter 1, verse number 15. Paul says, As much as in me is, I am now ready to preach the gospel to those of you who are at Rome also. So Paul had a great desire to go and preach to the church in Rome. He's going to go do work in Spain. That's his plans. He is going to need their support to do this work. If this church was behind Paul, if they could protect him against unfair attacks, anytime you stand for the truth, you're going to have enemies, ladies and gentlemen, members of the church of Christ. Everybody's not going to like you. And if you can't handle it because somebody doesn't like you because you stand up for something, you're in the wrong religion. You will be attacked. Paul's apostleship was often attacked. 
unfair attacks constantly were coming against the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians is written to counteract some of these ridiculous and most of the charges that are made are so ridiculous made against him. They could be of great help to his work as he went to the West. Perhaps unfair reports of Paul and his work had already reached the church at Rome. It had gone just about everywhere else. He needed to gain their confidence to prepare for the work in Spain. So you have the writing of the book of Romans. Phoebe, a wonderful Christian lady, was traveling to Rome maybe going to dwell there. Paul is going to introduce her and commend her to the congregation in chapter 16 and verse number 2. He wished to announce his plans to visit the congregation. He wanted them to know he was coming to visit them. Chapter 1, 10 through 13 to present an expanded explanation of the gospel that he preached. It is a logical presentation of God's plan to save man from his sins. He wanted to refute the error of the Judaizing teachers and all other false teachers. Romans 16, 17, and 18, I beseech you by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you mark them who cause offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Theme of the book. The theme of the book grows out of the purpose for the book. Chapter 1, verse 16 is the theme of the entire book. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Then notice the next verse, verse 17 for therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith is written, the just shall live by faith. What's verse 17 mean? The book was an explanation of how God makes man right through the gospel. Beautiful explanation of what it means to obey the gospel. The most beautiful explanation in all the Bible Paul says, when you are baptized into Christ, you're not baptized into the Baptist church. You're not baptized into the, some denomination out there built by some man. He said, when you are scripturally baptized, you're baptized into the death of Christ. You are buried with Christ in baptism. The old life is buried with Christ. You are raised to walk in newness of life. Thus, baptism is to have your sins forgiven. Not like the denominations teach. They teach that it shows you're already saved. Baptism is a point in your faith when the blood of Jesus takes away every sin. And the book of Romans shows that clearly in Romans 6, 1 through 5. Would you obey this gospel? Would you obey this gospel today?